buying where we are today, it's the same strategy. So could there be a dip? Sure. Is there going to be one? At some point, absolutely. But we're at record unemployment right now. We're basically at peak unemployment. GDP is still growing. But regardless of the sound bites in the news, you know, but if you look at the stats around the economy, not the stock market, but the economy and job growth and job movement, it's moving fine. Rent growth is still going up. Um, it dips in certain submarkets, but and then comes back. Um, so yeah, we're perfectly happy buying right now. We don't see any uh, meteor strike level issues out in the marketplace. Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, earn passive income, and start building equity in properties. Their simple, intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today. Hey, welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. Today I have with me Chad Doty. Chad, how are you doing? I'm outstanding. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, Chad's with 37th Parallel, and you guys invest in multifamily uh, syndications, mainly in Texas, but you guys have some holdings uh, elsewhere as well. Uh, and based out of uh, West Virginia, was it, or Virginia? Richmond, Virginia. Richmond, Virginia. Awesome. Well, Chad, with that, can you give our listeners a little bit more kind of about what you guys are doing right now and, and your background? Yeah. Um, what we do is we're basically in the business of commercial acquisitions and asset management. So we uh, buy and hold multifamily buildings um, to generate a income and equity growth stream for ourselves and for our clients. Uh, we've done close to 400 million in transaction volume, have 100% profitable track record. Uh, NMHC members have been 85,000 a couple of years. Um, but really it's just something that started with a investment premise of our own was that we wanted to hold really stable and hopefully evergreen assets that would be around for a long time. So uh, prior to starting the company in 2008, um, I basically, what I jokingly call a recovering management consultant. Um, I used to get dropped into companies when I worked for Arthur Anderson to make them run better. So I did operations improvement, operational M&A, uh, business and technology improvement, basically all ways to make businesses run better through tools, tech, process, what have you. Um, so I'm an operations guy. So, but I dealt with, I did see companies go under and we wanted to build a business that was could not be horse and buggy, couldn't be Kodak, couldn't be Blackberry, and, and multifamily is never going to go away. It's an evergreen industry. And then having the ability to op operate well in that space in the safest markets. So that's sort of the premise and kind of where we are today. Cool. Um, so prior to getting into that, getting into the field, you said you were working just a, a regular job. Is that correct? 
Um, kind of. I had a, I worked, I was a W-2 uh, from right out of school until um, probably 05, 06, basically. Mm -hmm. And then my, uh, uh, my son, so I, I, I got married really young, but then we waited uh, like 10 years to have kids. My wife, I find out I'm pregnant, and my wife's pregnant. Um, we're pregnant when I'm four hours away at a client site. So my wife calls me like, hey, I get a double tap on my cell phone. I'm like, okay. I show it to the, the CEO I'm talking with in a board meeting. It's like, hey, I got double tapped. He's like, yeah, I, yeah go ahead. I, something's going on. So yeah, everyone sort of got their own rules. So then I call her back and he's like, hey, what's up? I'm in the middle of a meeting. It's like, oh, we're pregnant. It's like, oh, and I can't hug her. I'm not there. I've got to wait to drive back the next day. And I, and I was worried about being that dad that wasn't there for my son. And my father was in the Navy and, and was deployed for six months out of the year when I was younger. And I never thought about the fact when I was growing up that I missed him. So it wasn't that I felt like it'd be robbing from my son, but it's more like I didn't want to miss that. So I was like, how do I architect it such that I can be there for the soccer games and coaching that stuff and his first steps. And, um, so very quickly after that, I can, I, built my own consultancy. So I moved, I went independent, started my own consulting company, ran that for a while, and then I got that time freedom, but then I was capped on income. Uh, if you're billing 150 to 200 bucks an hour, that's great, but you either have to add employees, there's a limit to how many hours you can bill, even with attorney fractional billing time. <laughs> um, so uh, I started looking into ways to create scalable passive income that was not time dependent, was, but was value dependent. And so that's, there's leverage on other people's money, other people's uh, time, you know, all that stuff. And, and eventually landed on, I wanted a bulletproof space I could devote my heart and soul to that I could build a platform on. That's kind of how I went from the three main stages from W2 to independent to real estate. So, um, when, when you did your, your first real estate deal was it was it multifamily syndication or was it a single family or what kind of what kind of was your first real estate deal um I, I, there's two firsts i had the unintentional first and the intentional first okay <laughs> let's talk about the intentional more than the unintentional. you can you can hit on both if you want well i'll, I'll leave with the unintentional first it's when i was in college my dad bought a duplex and the idea was hey you can live on one side rent free you renovate it i'll uh -huh. rent the other side then you'll flip yep. this happened in my 20s it made me hate real estate so i fought <laughs> it <laughs> i fought it for a long time and eventually i came back to it and i was like no there's a way to do it without being a landlord i didn't want to be deal with tennis and toilets yeah. Uh, while I can be handy, I only want to do it on my own clock and for my own house. I don't want to do it with someone else staring at me. I just want to be in that space. Um, so the first thing the thing I did was a six unit building. It was multifamily in Richmond. It's a historic building, and uh, I did it with a business partner, and that didn't go well uh, in terms of he spent the entire building's renovation budget on one kitchen. So we had oh. a we had a falling out. So there's lessons there about partnering. Um, I was like, okay, let's take me out. I was going to buy a 12 unit building and I had the capital to do so on my own. But then as I was talking to some other people who were, had thousands of doors, they're like, why are you doing this? It's the same effort, regardless of whether you're working on this size building or another building. It's just the capital stack you're working with. Learn how to get exposure to, to that capital and you can go much bigger, faster. And so that's what I did. And then eventually partnered up with a guy that was a, a longer term partnership. Eventually they were bought out of business. Um, but uh, the went from buying a six unit, almost buying a 12 and buying 112 units. My first, my next one was 112 unit multifamily, but it's all been multifamily. Nice. Nice. I like that. That's a very quick graduation. Uh, what well, bigger deal. Yeah. It probably took three years though, in terms sure. of, you know, getting the guts to do it. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, so what, what attracted you to, to multifamily versus other, you know, other asset classes or other businesses? Um, so in, let's compare commercial real estate to other businesses first. Um, so 
commercial real estate's tri multi-trillion dollar industry. If you look at the Forbes 400, um, the largest industry grouping is comes from real estate. They're typically not the highest, like they're not the Bill Gates, they're not the Zuckerbergs, they're not the whatever, but the, a good, the largest, one of the largest groups comes from real estate, whether it's development or ownership or whatever. And it's, uh, for, depending on the asset class inside real estate, it's a great inflation hedge. It's not as good as gold. The gold doesn't have a rate of return where real estate does. And because leases move with the market and expenses generally don't grow as quickly as lease structures do, you can fix costs based on the debt length. There's these features of how you manage income growth, the expense growth, and you have a market that is always in demand. Now, it ebbs and flows based on asset class, but there's always demand for it. But you have to deal. But then the problem with real estate is it still deals with economic cycle risk. So if you look at a big picture, the least exposure to economic cycle risk is multifamily because what drives multifamily isn't the economic cycle. It does secondarily, but it's really household formation, household movement. So if you can understand the demographics around household formation, household movement, household preference, those are the three pillars of multifamily demand, then it's a lot more level. It doesn't have the peaks and valleys of retail, office, uh, raw land, industrial, hospitality. Now you can make a ton of money in really good economic cycles in retail and office and hospitality, but you're gonna give it back when it's lean. Where in multifamily, you're gonna make more when it's good and lose less when it's not. So the risk adjusted return in multifamily is better than any other real estate asset class once you get past the five year old debt. And that's been, it's been like that for years, like 30, 40 plus. Yeah. So that's kind of what drew us to that. I mean, okay, okay, how do we micro segment that to the meat of the bell curve? And all we do is work, workforce or B grade multifamily. So it's 1980 to 2005 built stuff serving the middle of the median income, which is like 57,000. So you're serving the meat of the U.S. economy. You're serving the meat of the U.S. population. And that's the place we stay, the, the, where we play. Interesting. Cool. Yeah, I, I've always, I've got a few friends that do a lot of commercial and, uh, you know, they do really well in, in good times like now. But um, it's always made me nervous because when, when the economy goes down and you see whatever, that shopping center or even that office building and you see all those vacants, it goes, I just, I, you wonder how they cannot fill those up. And it takes them a long time, quite frankly, to fill them up in, in poor times. So uh, it'll be interesting, the friends that I have in commercial, uh, how well they do in a down cycle, hopefully well. Uh, but <laughs> Yeah, cer certain places stay insulated. And yeah. a, lot of, a lot of it then is less on the asset class. It's more on lease quality and zip code quality. You know, it, gets, it gets really, really fragmented at that point and it's it's and it, and you kind of got to be willing to in the retail office space to buy quality even if you overpay in good times to know that it insulates you more in bad times if that's your play yeah yeah um so you've got a pretty successful business you've got you know you've done an over 400 million in in deals uh acquisitions um what advice would you give us about operating a business successfully? Um, depends on what stage you're at in the business. Um, all of business is, uh, you're basically playing a game of whack-a-mole. <laughs> and I don't mean that like it, it's frenzied and unplanned. It's that you are, you have to understand the theory of constraints and that the most business is not like in your own personal growth, it's valuable to focus on your strengths and then build around you. But a business doesn't work that way. It has a minimum set of functionality along finance and operations, and HR and business development and all those different pieces have to have some minimum functionality to it, whether that's all you doing the work, whether that's you and some of the outsourced stuff too, or whether that's your team. So, the very beginning thing is, you know, if you're in real estate, you already know you have a market that's in demand, but find out what your particular capability is and focus on that. 
so that, and that's, we call that, uh, internally we call that something called a MAC profile, which is your market approach and capability. So find out what you're best at and find those markets where your, that approach is optimal for that location. Because some people might want to do build in a declining market. You might be great at building, but you're still going to lose money. Or they might want to be a, a long-term holder in a market that has flat population growth. Well, your rent growth is going to be lower than you expect. So you've got to fit those together. Then that's your business concept. Then from there, it's just building the business up. And then at some point, you scale to, it's not just you, then it's team, you know, that team, what are they best at? And then eventually, it's a point where you're, you're, instead of managing people and process so much, you're more managing future growth initiatives. So it just it depends on the iteration of the business. But out of the gate, know what you're willing to get good at. And it's not, if you're not already an expert at it, that's probably the case because you're new. So it's really what are you willing to get good at and, and make sure that, that the thing you're willing to get good at, you can apply to any market cycle. It, I'm really risk averse. So some people just want to try to hit a home run and, and get out. I'm more of a batting percentage, not slugging percentage guy. Um, I'm gonna kind of go go back a little bit. Are you are you guys doing value add? Or are you doing just um, long term buy and hold? What what kind of properties are you guys buying? We do both. So yeah, we typically meaning that it's all the same thing. In that we will look to purchase a deal either uh, at we'll buy a deal at market for its current capability, and we'll look to do a light to moderate value add improvement program by adding, you know three to 10 K a door combined in unit improvements, amenity refresh, marketing uplift, signage, stuff like that to bring it up where we can get an extra hundred bucks a door over a two to three year window that creates an initial value pop and then resets it's where it sits in the market. And then you own where it sits in the market to good operations. And then you can then reevaluate every three to five years on your strategy. But if you're, if you have good dirt, you tend to keep, good dirt and then just look to shift to what the, what the market is doing within your five mile area. And that, that, that's what kind of controls that asset. Yeah. So are you, are you selling? Yeah. Are you the, the, we buy, uh, do that value add three to five years later, we're going to sell it. Or are you kind of keeping your investors in it's long-term um, wealth building? What, what, where are you at with that? It's the latter. Um, both, both are great. I mean, I, um, neither one's right or wrong. I think it just depends on, like our, our overall goal is to build a ever increasing yield production or cash flow producing platform. So that's really, at that point, that's your premise. You're an accumulator, okay? Because you are trying to manage tax efficiency. You're trying to manage operational efficiency. And that happens with time. Now, it doesn't mean we won't do, like, we'll create value at the same pace, a three to five year flip company, but instead of selling it out and dealing with the tax consequences, we will refinance it, look to redeploy that capital into another asset. By doing so, we grow yield. Um, there's this underlying, we call it the permanent wealth architecture, not to be hyperbolic, but there's no such thing as permanent wealth, but there are features of investments that are do better over the long run. And so the first one is you've got to maintain principal maintenance, don't lose money. Second thing is it has to have some level of consistent cash flow. Then if you can grow cash flow, that's the third tier. Then if you grow cash flow in an income producing asset, you're going to grow value. And then the fifth, if you're doing all four of those, then you'll have some type of ability to uh, accelerate cash flow or equity growth through refinance and reinvest or sell in 1031. Either way, you kind of have to do this order and they're, they're, pill they're, they're, they're layers on each other. It's more pyramid nature that they're not pillars. You have to be one before the other, but that's our, that's our model. I like it. I like that a lot. Um, yeah, I definitely uh, like the longer term holds, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not averse definitely to selling, but I like the longer term holds and that cash flow and, and building that, that long-term wealth. Um, 
What's your biggest mistake and how have you learned from it? Um, biggest mistake I think is, is team choices. You know, when you go to build a, we've got 14 staff members now. Um, it's when you're running a small company, the who you bring on board, and especially depending on where they are, the, the weakest link controls your performance speed. And so f being willing to overpay for an A player is far better than having whatever budget you might deem be appropriate and getting a B minus C player. Because the impact your P&L is 10x their salary, just if they're good. And it's flat to negative if they're not. Like, so I can't remember where I read it. It was a CEO who was talking about when they do staff evaluations. If you were to rate uh, a team member on the scale of one to 10, um, they had to be a nine or a 10 uh, uh, to, to get hired, eight or 10 to get higher. And if and they were, you were never allowed to pick seven. Because seven was the cop out. It's like, you didn't want to be mean, but they weren't good enough to be an eight or nine or a 10. So you hire eight to tens. If it's a seven or below, they're out, you know. And just look to hire and be willing to pay for it only the best. And, uh, you know, this is not new advice for anyone, but it amazes me how much damage it causes us, not in both in brain damage, machinations, morale, uh, lack of ability to grow. It's not like the business is going to fail, but the inability to execute on a high performance growth plan with the wrong players is just, it's hell. <laughs> it's hard, you know? So, yeah, that's dead staff. Absolutely. Cool. At, our, at our stage, I'm not saying that's the best advice for somebody just starting out, but where yeah. we are, that's, that's the current pain I deal with. Yeah, I'm assuming when you started out, it was you and maybe a partner or two and uh, maybe maybe one one employee or something like that. But yeah. as, you, as you grow. Yeah, and, I'll, and, the, and that, I see basically two successful models in the space. You've got a primary driver owner who then will have one or two key staff that they're not owners, but they're just wired to perform well and they're incentivized well, but there's one person. The downside is that there's one person. So you're kind of, you're alone at the top and sometimes you don't know when you're drinking your own Kool-Aid, but I see plenty of successful companies like that in our, in our area. And then what you also see, and I think these tend to grow a little bit steadier, they're less volatile, but, but um, is where you have sort of this pick, like, because I've got a fantastic business partner in that. We, we both came from the consulting space. We know how to deconstruct businesses and problems very quickly. We both know how to call each other on, on our bullshit, uh, but also know what we're good at. And I do certain things that I'm better at than him, but he can do the same things I can and vice versa. And that's, that's rare, but that, that is, on the, when we're talking about staff, that's probably one of our success criteria is that we have that, you know, as the two primary owners, we have that interaction yep. process. Yep. That's great. Definitely great. Um, hey, I want to interrupt this episode real quick to talk to you about Nate Armstrong. Uh, our sponsor, Nate Armstrong, he's with homeinvest.com. And you want to get to know Nate. So go to homeinvest.com and just connect with Nate. Talk to him. Learn about his operation, what he's got going on. He's a turnkey provider, and it may not be right for you, but it could be the perfect fit. So it doesn't hurt. It's a free call, free consultation just to figure out, you know, what they do, what they have to offer. And worst case is you're going to meet a great person who's really well educated in real estate. He's done a ton of different real estate strategies and probably he's going to teach you a little bit, even on a short conversation uh, with him. So go to homeinvest.com and, and, and uh, connect with Nate's company. You're definitely not going to be disappointed. It's worth it. So uh, thanks. And we'll get back to our show. So take us through that mind shift of becoming this entrepreneur. You know, you got, you had your uh, W2 and then you wanted to get out of it. I guess you kind of already, already said that. Um, so maybe, maybe I'm repeating myself by doing that. Uh, was there anything else, I guess, other than uh, seeing that, you know, being able to see your kids and stuff like that, that, that made that difference? 
Um, yeah, I mean, there, there was there was the kid thing, but there's also the aspirational thing, and I don't, you know, like uh, Dan, my business partner. Literally, if you were to say, okay, you make a hundred times more than what you make now, what do you do? Is like eighty percent of it. I would help with certain charitable causes, like his. His grandfather used to be a, a, a dean of Christian colleges across the U.S. and he basically buy a house for a, a disadvantaged family once a year. And, mm -hmm. and I'm like, and I'm like, it's fantastic. That doesn't wake me up in the morning, but it wakes him up in the morning, you know? So it, knowing that he can do that stuff, great. I'm more of a time freedom peak experience kind of person. Um, so I remember sitting on, a, I took my wife on a trip our ninth anniversary and I was on an overwater bungalow in, in Tahiti. This is totally first world problem stuff. So I probably saw it. <laughs> but I'm watching, and, but the trip was paid for by points because I'd basically been a road warrior for years and years and years. It wasn't like I was spending 20 grand in a pocket for this vacation, but I'm watching this guy on the outside of an atoll in Bora Bora. And he, he goes, he basically sails the boat, docks the catamaran, gets off, kiteboards down the reef, kiteboards back up the reef, pulls the, cat, the kite down, gets back on the boat and sails away. And I'm, my wife's laughing at me because I'm sitting there open mouth just staring at this guy for like four hours watching this unfold. And I'm like, that's the perfect morning. Why couldn't every morning be like that? And then it's, uh, we get stuck in a rut of these small dreams of, you know, I want this or I want that. And it's like, no, it can be whatever you want it to be. Just have the guts to do it and to be clear on it and to, and to deal with the pain of not the, that, uh, that disconnected feeling you have when you ha don't have it yet, you know, create that stress for yourself. Um, so that, that also occurred too. It wasn't just the time with my son. It was also that I wanted just more out of life. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to do that when you're stuck in a job all the time working for somebody else. I mean, so, some people can, but uh, it's definitely harder to do, I think. Yeah. Autonomy is a huge deal to me. It's absolutely a huge deal to me. Yeah. Cool. Um, what are, what are two key factors to your success or to your company's success? What, what have you guys done? Discipline is one of them. Um, we have a very, very structured approach to, the macroeconomics of a state and MSA and submarket and neighborhood and 135 mile area and site that we basically step through. And we takes very few negative uh, data points for us to walk away. Because when you go to buy a deal, you're married to the deal. Real estate is not liquid. And so all your due you know, your due diligence must occur up front or else you kind of have that shotgun wedding effect where you're, where you're like, hey, the, the bride's great, but her family's crazy. And so you have to get that stuff figured out. So discipline to go through that process in every single deal, like you're investing your grandma's last $100,000. If anything, that love, that discipline and risk approach has helped us most with being a profitable one every deal. Hmm. Um, the other one I think is being trying to be as client focused as we can is that um, we're, we've got over 500 investors across the U S and trying to understand that while we have a fixed investment product in that we do a particular thing and try to do it as, as best we can, how that is tailored, recorded, distributed and offered to our client base varies over time and based on the makeup of that group and being sensitive to that is also useful because a busy client who doesn't, who, a retail client who just has a million other things they're thinking about, they need clarity, convenience, and speed when it comes to stuff. And so being able to take an uh, inefficient uh, asset, i.e. real estate, and make it fit that model for them is also something we, we try to focus on. Cool. Um, w when you're doing, uh, your syndication, you're dealing with your investors, give me a couple of thoughts on, uh, you know, for, for the, the person that wants to, whether they want to syndicate or whether they want to take whatever, if they want to use other people's money, um, 
Give me some thoughts on a building up that in investor list of 500. So, so first of all, that, and then how are you dealing with all these personalities? Um, so the first part is, uh, when it comes to putting money together is I think there's this, there's this myth and I think it gets, it gets perpetrated by late night TV and or books on sale, but that if you have a good deal, money will find you. (laughs) And that is, that is at best a half truth. I believe it's, it's false at, you know, at first blush. Um, Money flows to people that know what they're doing is the rule of money. It's the absolute rule of money. It works every single asset class, every single market. Money flows to people that know what they're doing. Because if you think about, you know, envision uh, a, your drunk, unemployed uncle who has never held down anything more than a lawn loan job came to you with a deal of the century, would you invest with him? The answer is no. Right. So, so the, what that requires in if that's the rule of money is for you to ask for money, you must know in your bones that you are worth getting it. So you've got to do the work educationally and experientially to make sure that regardless of that source of that money, you're treating it with utmost care. You have to have that client service mentality. I remember, um, this stuck with me from consulting. I went to my, 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 one of my prior partners and I was in my late twenties. And I was doing well, I, I got promotions and stuff. And I'm like, hey, what else can I do better? Because I got to exceed performance, all's fine. I said, what else do I do? It's like, don't overcomplicate it, son. You sell it, you do it, you collect the bill. And your client has to know that you're at home sweating in a fetal position every night, worrying about their job more than they are, because otherwise, why would they pay you? Hmm. You know, so we believe that you need to have that same belief about that if you're taking someone else's capital that person who's investing with you must know that about you otherwise they're gambling they're not investing and so that's a going in peace and sometimes that 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 makes people too cautious but it's far better to be too cautious and too aggressive because that's where the you know american greed and stupid stories come from be worth it um and then and whatever that takes uh, educational partnering, whatever, make it happen. On the more. personality side, um, it's there are plenty of times in our early history where we took on investors that we shouldn't have, and there were red flags early on. But because we were trying to get deals done, it, it the getting the deal done beat the future worry about the long term working relationship, and. So I'm not one to sit up on the high horse and say, never do it, because just sometimes you have to. It's just understand or don't be shocked if you get strange behavior, because people aren't going to change their personality for you. <laughs> um, so the, but what you should do is have a very clear, here's what we do, here's who we do it for, and that this is not, you're not buying a widget. You're creating a partnership, meaning that, they as a client have responsibilities too in that they must be able to respond to communications yes or no they must be able to complete paperwork in a timely fashion they must be able to fund if there's anything that requires them to have a vote or a say or a voice then they need to be there for that it while it's passive there's still interaction gates that are required because you're not buying a widget at the dollar store you know it's a, so that creating that more of that partnership environment and being very clear about who you are, because if you're, if you're unclear about who you are, a certain personalities will be either, well, I want to do X or other personalities will be like, well, if you don't know what you're doing, how can I trust you? So it's far better to come in with, here's what we do and here's what we're good at and let people push on that. And you explain why versus be all things, all people. Um, I think that will help a ton too. Yeah, I agree. I, I've had, um, for me, it's been learning as far as, you know, that clear expectation and, and the investors knowing what they, you know, what, what kind of decisions they get to make and what kind of decisions they don't get to make. That's been really helpful for me, kind of basically where you're at. I mean, 
uh, I can think back to a couple early deals where I essentially allowed the investors to, to make the decisions if they wanted to. It was just nothing was written in our contract. And so they, they would tell me what to do and when to sell and all that kind of stuff. And, and that one of the deals, uh, one of my earliest deals that was, you know, when things worked out, but it was, it would have been a lot better deal had I not given that control. So, right. Uh, clear, clear expectations. Definitely. I, I agree. Yeah. And, and there's way, there's race great hybrid series. You can say, Hey, look, uh, this deal will be held and we'll be distributing operating profits as they occur until we hit X hurdle rate that point we can make a, a keeper, a keeper sell vote. But until then you won't. So at least you have some you know, hurdle that gives you control at that point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what's your company's goals moving forward? What do you see uh, as your company, you know, five years, 10 years, whatever? Um, we, we're, we're just doing a little bit of shifting right now, but as a goal, we want to be acquiring 100 million or more in multifamily each year. Um, and we'll hit that run rate this year and then we'll continue it. We're also, every single deal we've done to date has been a single asset, meaning there's a raise to a deal, a deal closes, and then all those investors are in that project. They'll be in 11 investors in one to 10. Um, we'll be adding a fund model, a GP level fund of 20 to 40 million for those people that want sort of instant diversification, and, but are okay not having a vote on the deal. We have investors that want both. Some, I want to know exactly the zip code and in. Some are like, no, I trust you guys. You've got a good track record. I want to know get diversification from investment one. So by adding both of those, that'll then allow us to create that $100 million a year acquisition target and then accelerate from there based on the fund growth. Those, those are two big deals for us. You talked about how detailed uh, you are when you guys want to buy. You know exactly where you want to buy and, and uh you know, what, what age and all that kind of stuff. How do you find a hundred million dollars worth of deals that work um, in a year's time? If you're that detailed. Um, you are, I mean, you, we, we have found that we tend to be able with our current staff, we're able to buy at a three to five deal a year run rate. Meaning that we'll be looking at, 500 or so projects across the markets we're in. They'll go through different vetting criteria to get to a certain number of letters of intent to a certain number of awarded contracts. Um, so to a certain extent, it's a numbers game to where you can get to that. And you're just buying at, if you want to buy four deals in a year, and your target's 100 million, you're buying 25 to $30 million projects. Um, and there are, there's a lot of that actually. Um, it's just that if you're just starting out, you tend not to see it. Um, but there's a ton of product in that 30 to 50 million space that is what's called uh, overlap institutional. You have a lot of like private equity firms like us who play there and you have a little bit in the institutional space. But it's not like you have a REIT coming out there and, and you know they're looking to deploy $200 million or a billion dollars. And so if someone like us might accumulate and sell to them but they're not coming in necessarily and buying those deals when they're listed. They're, they're really going to take that off the market from another portfolio buyer. So it's a, it's a good sort of hybrid space and, and also can work from the, the 15 to 30 down. It's just in the, the 20 and 15 down, you sort of have sometimes more of that individual investor play that might be buying for a family office, whatever. So there's different tiers that you just have to understand the competition. Um, and no, where you can overpay slightly. Uh, and it's absolutely, you know, it's August of 2018, just from a podcast dating perspective, but the market right now is a seller's market. And so you've got to be willing to know where you can buy at or above market at a compressed cap rate and how you can create safety in a 12 month window or less, which is really going to require some sort of value add program. There's really no way you're going to cut to a level of safety you have to create it but you can and still in knowing that you're a long-term holder it actually gives us more flexibility because we can take a longer period of time for that value improvement or that hold period whereby a three to five a three-year flipper in a in our market 
if they can't get deep value at day one, they've got to pass. So we can actually buy more than say a certain other kind of buyer because of our time frame. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, you're, you're looking at buying a hundred million, uh, or so, you know, a year. And you also mentioned though, we're in 2018 and we've got a seller's market. And I think, you know, we all know that eventually it's going to turn and we don't know when, but, uh, but you're still buying. So that tells me, uh, whether you're, nervous about it or not, but it, it tells me that you're still seeing that there's opportunity. Um, wh why do you think there's opportunity? Why are you still buying versus waiting until the next quote unquote crash comes? Um, we're we're going to do both, quite frankly, is because you can buy now. If you, if you go back and look at what happened in really nine and 10, yep. um, that's when you had the real estate dip. And if you look at it nationally, you, you see that all, at, all real estate asset classes dipped, but multifamily dipped less than hospitality, retail, and office. Um, so it, 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 its drop is lower. Then if you take that and you deconstruct A, B, and C, you know, 10 years in newer, 10 to 30 years old, and 30 plus or highly deferred maintenance, if you look in that B group, it dropped less than A's and less than C's, okay? Then if you take that B group and you look at it in the sub-markets that had more stable economies, more stable real estate markets, Texas, the Carolinas, you know, you avoid the sand states, Florida, Arizona, California, Nevada, right? Then the drop got even lower. Then it's less of a drop, it's a dip. It's not a drop. So you have the largest real estate recession since the Great Depression, but in certain asset classes, they rode along fine. They didn't raise rents anymore. They might've dipped a little bit, but they still made money. And that's the kind of assets we're buying. So we're buying to where we can get moderate profitability today to know we can, we can continue to get it. So buying where we are today, it's the same strategy. So could there be a dip? Sure. Is there gonna be one? At some point, absolutely. But we're at record unemployment right now. We're basically at peak unemployment. GDP is still growing. Regardless of the sound bites in the news, you know, but if you look at the stats around the economy, not the stock market, but the economy and job growth and job movement, it's moving fine. Rent growth is still going up. Um, it dips in certain sub markets, but and then comes back. Um, so yeah, we're perfectly happy buying right now. We don't see any uh, meteor strike level issues out in the marketplace. Perfect. Um, what's a what's a favorite? book or that you're reading either right now or that you've read or that listening to? Um, I think a fundamental read for any business owner is a book called The Goal by Eli Goldratt. It's about the theory of constraints and about how you manage growth. It's actually, it was built around like a manufacturing environment, but it works for any business and how you understand that removing bottlenecks as a structured process will do more for the business than growing sales if you can't deliver or reducing expenses to impact it. It's just, it's a different way to look at things. That is a highly useful lens. I think every business owner should read it. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, last question before we wrap up, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Um, I kind of talked about that permanent wealth architecture piece, those, those five things we look at. That's a big part of that. I mean, if you, if you deconstruct what is required to get, okay, don't lose money. Okay, what, what are all the features of the investment that would have to make it such that it didn't lose money? You know, hot, best risk adjusted return, really, really, really low uh, loan charge off rates, failure rates, you know, sub 0.2%. Um, 100% evergreen client, all those things are about principal safety. Then income, it lets you ride anything because you're getting paid to hold that asset in good times and bad. Then the other three flavors about growing income and growing equity growth, those are all about operational proficiency. So the first part is about due diligence. The first one is having the rigor to buy in the right locations matching your, your approach. 
but growing income and growing equity, those are about having operational skill sets and, and having those too. So uh, if, if you were to go back to that part of the, when I went through that, that to me is if you can do that on all your investments, there's no way you don't need money. There's no way you don't build it real well. Cool. Um, well, Chad, how can people get in touch with you? Um, our website is uh, 37 parallel. That's 37 P A R A double E L dot com. Um, and we also have a, depending on their interest level, we also put together something called evidence based investing. It's a book that is a lot of third party data around not why 37th parallel. It's not 2D Marborn necessarily. It's more why commercial multifamily real estate. What are the, what is the objective long-term evidence around this asset class? It's just a fantastic piece on why you should look at this space. I mean, it's good for both active and passive investors and that's 37parallel.com slash EBI. Awesome. Awesome. We'll put that in the show notes. I like it. Um, well, I think that's it. We, uh, I think had a, a pretty good amount of information that you gave us. So I definitely appreciate that. I, I thank you a lot for taking the time out of your day and, and spending it with us. And I know my listeners uh, have learned a lot from you. Yeah, our pleasure. You do great work. I mean, some of your prior podcasts are fantastic. So thank you for doing what you're doing. I appreciate it. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks. Take care. A special thanks to Chad Doty for joining us on the show. Appreciate all the value he's added uh, to the show. And a few things I learned from it, three things that I took. Uh, first of all, he talked about find out what you're best at and, uh, and then find a market that fits for that. So instead of just going and picking a market, figure out what, your, what fits you, what fits your company, and then find the market around that. I thought that was really interesting, very different approach from what a lot of people do, but I think very a solid approach as well. Uh, the next thing he talked about is being disciplined. And he talked about that specifically in discipline and what you buy. Uh, a lot of people will go out there and they'll just buy any good deal that comes their way or anything that they think is a good deal, but it's not a good deal if it doesn't fit what really uh, is your specialty, is your objective. I could buy a property that um, you know maybe is a good deal, but if it doesn't fit my criteria, if it doesn't fit my company, I might not be able to turn it into a good deal or make it, you know, work well for me. So make sure you're being disciplined in that and don't just pick everything outside the box. Make sure it fits in that box that you've created, that your company is, is good at and can specialize in. Uh, the last thing he talked about is just building uh, a great team, scaling your team, uh, scale with your team. And we hear it over and over, uh, have a good solid team around you and you're gonna have a lot more success. Uh, it's easy to go at it alone, but uh, building a team is gonna be the most uh, amount of success for you if you got good people around you. So again, appreciate Chad to being on the show and, and spending time with us, tons of value. I know uh, I learned a ton, I'm sure you did as well. So thanks for listening. Go onto our Facebook page, go on to our Pillars of Wealth Facebook page, make some comments, let us know what you're thinking, let us know, um, you know, if you got any questions, I'd love to answer them. We definitely uh, try to be very responsive on there. Uh, the other thing is, you know, uh, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, uh, subscribe, wherever you're listening, subscribe to our show and share it out. Let other people know. Uh, that you enjoy it and uh, share it out and help us uh, help us grow our show as well and, and reach more people. I'm Todd Daxhammer. I'm signing off. Make every day a Saturday. Are you ready to start investing in real estate today, but don't know where to start? Sometimes investing can seem way too complicated, but it actually couldn't be any easier than with homeinvest.com. You know the co-founder and my friend, Nate Armstrong. He appeared on episode 20, and if you haven't heard it, go back and listen to it, episode number 20. Home Invest is a company that allows you to invest in turnkey real estate. Their goal is to build powerful investment tools that make real estate investing accessible to everyone. They have contractors and property managers available for you with the click of your mouse. While other real estate agents can only offer a property, Home Invest brings you a full turnkey package that allows you to diversify your investments, 
earn passive income and start building equity in properties. Their simple, intuitive design allows newcomers and experienced investors alike to hit the ground running and to be able to choose the properties when they want and where they want. View easy to understand charts and data to allow you to buy in only a few clicks or just a simple phone call. With Home Invest, you'll be building your portfolio as quickly or as slowly as you would like. And right now, Home Invest is giving our listeners, Pillar of Wealth Creation listeners, a free course on how to finally win in real estate investing. So go to homeinvest.com forward slash pillars. That's homeinvest.com forward slash pillars to claim your free course today.